any of the NBA playoffs this spring? Everyone. Yeah? Everyone saw Kawhi against the 76ers, the shot and the bounce and the bounce and then the bounce and then in. All of the historic Raptors moments in recent years, including their NBA championship, while you were watching the voice you were hearing, whether you were out at the bar or at home with friends, those where were you when moments were narrated by this man right here. And that is Matt Devlin, who spoke at the first ever primetime sports conference as well. He's a lifer. Matt Devlin, everyone. First of all, Trevor and Brian, thank you for having me. And I was talking to Brian and he mentioned, you know, maybe you want to talk a little bit about where you started and how you got to where you are today. That would take up way too much time. But just a couple of things I learned along the way for those that are looking to get into the industry before I take you through uh, the NBA title run and then we'll have a Q&A after. Patiently persistent. Patiently persistent. You go, well, hey, how can you be patient and persistent at the, t the same time? You have to be patient because you never know if it's going to happen on your time. But you have to be persistent. What are you doing on a daily basis to get that opportunity? And I remember starting out in 1991, my first job out of Boston College was in Abilene, Texas for $5 an hour. Five bucks an hour at WKRBC Big Country Sports, and I covered high school football in West Texas, Friday Night Lights, and it was a big deal. We used to have a special show on Friday nights, and we would call around. You know where we get all the score updates? The Dairy Queens. You call the Dairy Queen in Wiley, Texas. Hey, what's the score of the game? Well, Matt, it's uh, third quarter, 10-6, Wiley. All right, great. And then we go, and that's where you'd get all the information. But that was 1991, and from that point up until my first NBA job in 2001 with a team, there were a lot of roads and a lot of being patiently persistent. And if you have any questions about any of that, we can go into that after this title run that I want to share with you. When Masai Ujiri, and unfortunately Masai couldn't be here today, they actually have a ceremony going on right now at the OVO Athletic Center. When Masai Ujiri took over as president of the Toronto Raptors and general manager, he later uh, turned the GM job over to Jeff Weltman, who went to Orlando, and then subsequently Bobby Webster took over as general manager. He was emphatic, three words, we will win. Every single day, we will win. We will win every single day. If you talk to Masai Ujiri, that's what he talked about. The Toronto Raptors in 2018 in the second round held the lead in game one against the Cleveland Cavaliers entering the fourth quarter and ultimately ended up losing in overtime. Some of you may recall that. After that game, you had that sense that LeBron James and the Cavaliers were going to sweep the, uh, the Toronto Raptors. That's ultimately what happened. In the first of three significant decisions were made by Masai, all three extremely difficult. And decisions that if you get and if and when you get to that opportunity in your life to be a GM or president or any position that you may hold, you may be faced with them. He had the NBA coach of the year, a well-respected man in the industry, somebody that had brought the organization to its highest success coming off of a 59 season, uh, 59 win season in Dwayne Casey. And Masai Ujiri made the decision to let him go and hired his assistant, Nick Nurse. So that was the first key decision, difficult decision that he made. The second was trading DeMar DeRozan, a beloved figure with the Toronto Raptors, along with Jakob Pertl and a first round pick to the San Antonio Spurs for a generational player, a franchise player in Kawhi Leonard. The season gets underway and what happens at the trade deadline? Three players 
two of which you had developed in DeLon Wright and Jonas Valanciunas, and a veteran C.J. Miles were traded for Marc Gasol, which was ultimately the final piece that, at least in my opinion, everybody sensed that this is an opportunity that the Raptors are going to have that chance to win an NBA title. And I think it solidified Kyle Lowry's belief that this was a team. Despite 22 different starting lineups throughout the course of the season and load management, which we can get into later if you would like, the Raptors finished with the second best record in the NBA. The first game against Orlando, anybody here remember the first game? What happened? It was a loss. And everybody thought, oh no, <laughs> here we go again. A loss to Orlando. It was later revealed in an interview with Kyle Lowry that he talked about Nick Nurse twice, two times during the course of the season, postseason, got after the team. And I'll never forget going to the practice facility the day after that loss. Media meets with Nick. Fortunately, through the years, I had developed a strong relationship with Nick Nurse, who is a brilliant basketball coach. And practice ended, media availability ended, and Nick and I drifted to the corner of the practice facility and just started talking. And he goes, Matty, I don't know, man. I got after him today. I said, you did? He goes, yeah, but I mean, I got after him. He goes, I had a plan to go through the film session and then get after him at different points. But he said, it started right away. And then once I got through that and we get on the floor, I figured, hey, I'm done. I'm not going to get after him anymore. And then he said, ball, <laughs> ball was handed out, basketball was handed out. Next thing you know, I get after him again. He said, this can go either way. I want to see how they respond. Now, how did he get after him, right? Hey, you're going into the postseason. Everybody here knows what our objectives are. You're veterans. Two of you in the room have won it before. Kyle, you've been to a conference finals. You lost. Marcus All, you've been to a conference finals and lost. This is a team that's supposed to win, right? And you play like that. And I'm leaving out, obviously, a lot of the colorful language. Raptors go on and do what? They win four consecutive games. And then, in my opinion, which was without question the most difficult series, the Philadelphia 76ers. And this is what you learn over the course of two months. Roster construction and your coach's ability, depending upon how the series is going, to make the necessary changes. Before we get to the shot, which was the greatest shot in franchise history, Philadelphia, why were they so difficult to handle? Because they were big and long. Raptors did not play that way, but yet they had a roster that could. Serge Ibaka and Marcus Gasol, after Mark was acquired on February the 9th, had played all the 31 minutes together. 31 minutes together as two bigs. And as that series went on, Nick Nurse knew that the only way to beat Philadelphia is to play like Philadelphia and to play big. And so here was Marcus Gasol and Serge Ibaka now playing together 30-plus minutes a night. And what did that allow? That allowed Siakam to go to the three, the small forward. It allowed then Kawhi Leonard to go to the two from small forward to the shooting guard. And then the point guard was Kyle Lowry. And that set the scene for the greatest shot in franchise history with 4.2 seconds left. The only time in NBA history 
that a game seven shot was made to win a series. Inbound pass, Kawhi turns the corner, Ben Simmons, who's 6'10", point guard, hands him off to Joel Embiid. Kawhi Leonard now drifting into the corner, fading over the top of a seven foot three Joel Embiid, high arcing shot, deep in the corner, goes up, hits the rim softly once, twice, three times. Everybody's looking at it, four times, and then through. Raptors win it. If the shot didn't go, it was overtime but they win it. And after that game, which to me opened up just a sliver of who Kawhi Leonard was and is, he said, you know, I typically like to act as though I've made that shot before or I've done something before, but I allowed myself to show emotion that time, because I had never made that shot before. Never mind you that that shot had never been made in NBA history. And you can see, if you go back and watch the video, for about 20 seconds, he enjoys the euphoria of that moment, and then he starts pushing his teammates away, because he was on to the next. And this team really took on an embodiment of staying focused and living in the moment, which brought the Raptors to their second Eastern Conference Finals, and this one against the Milwaukee Bucks, who by all accounts, the best team in the Eastern Conference. Raptors hold the lead. They lose the lead two days after winning the Game 7. In the fourth quarter, they ran out of gas. And I'll never forget leaving the arena in Milwaukee that night and saying to myself, Raptors are a better team. Because roster construction, again, the way that the Ra Raptors roster was put together, it allowed them to go back to against the Milwaukee Bucks, who they were. Fred Van Vliet, as we know, came on strong during that series. There was one outlier game. That was game two. Most important thing that happened after game two, Marcus Saul in front of the media, the veteran, had been to a Western Conference Finals with the Memphis Grizzlies. What does he say? That game's on me. Now, was it really on Mark? It wasn't just on Mark. It was on a lot of guys. But he took the responsibility to say, you know what? It's on me. And then in the post game. When Kawhi was asked, where do you go from here, down 0-2, what does he say? Go back to Toronto for game three. It just shows where this team was. The selfless acts of each other, inclusive of, in that game seven against Philadelphia, Serge Ibaka, who, and a prideful man, a great player, took a lesser role when Marcus Saul came on the team and was traded for. But in that game seven, often forgotten, but I always remind people he had 17 points did surge in that game and they wouldn't have won it without his performance. A very selfless team. Raptors come back game three and what happens? They really, I think they broke Milwaukee that night in a double overtime victory. And you go on now, and you think about game six, 24 seasons in the making. Raptors are headed to their first ever NBA Finals. Team dialed in at this point. They know, they know they're right there and have an opportunity to win. You have home court advantage against the Golden State Warriors, and you take game one pretty much with ease. Game two, Golden State in their fifth consecutive finals. Two-time defending champ, they take game two. They respond like champions do. 
And I'm sure some of you have heard the story about what happened in the locker room after that game. When Nick Nurse said, hey, they got one here. Let's go get one there and take home court back. And what did Kawhi say? Best player in the room. He said, I'm not, I'll leave out the, the one word he said. Forget that. Let's go get them both. Let's go get them both. Raptors go to Oakland, take both. And every night when you saw them walk off, right, walk off the floor, all of them dialed in, no celebration, knowing that there were still 16 wins to get to, the first to 16 wins. Series moves on, game five, here at Scotiabank Arena. If the Raptors had won that night, I don't know what would have happened to the arena, quite honestly. <laughs> People, I think, would have left with chairs and everything. I think pieces of the floor. You could feel the tension in the building. Raptors with a lead. And then it starts slipping away. You come down to the final play for the win. Kawhi puts it on the floor. As he's going toward the right wing, he's doubled. He gives it up to Fred Van Vliet. Fred, one time on the floor, makes a move driving into the paint, thinking that he has Draymond Green coming over to double him, which then gives Kyle Lowry a wide-open three-point shot in the corner. One time on the floor, makes a pass. Draymond was sitting there hedging, right, knowing that he had Kyle in the corner. Kyle puts up the shot. Draymond comes flying over and literally fingertip. And it alters the trajectory of the shot, and it hits the side of the backboard. Raptors lose the game, and now you have game six upon us. I remember leaving that night with my family, actually, after the game, and I was down in the parking lot. And as we were leaving, Nick Nurse was standing to the side looking at his phone, and I rolled down the window. I'm like, Coach, whew, you know? He goes, hey, it's all right, Matty. Nobody said it was going to be easy. We got this. I thought to myself, man, he's confident. And it was the first time, and maybe because there's a little bit of, I've been here now 12 years, right? You know, will Toronto <laughs> overcome things and ultimately win. You don't want to jinx anything. I hadn't even thought about winning at all at that time. Everybody was so locked in on just the 48 minutes that day, that game. And the next day, about, got home at about 1.30 in the morning, text comes, be at the airport 9.45 a.m. to fly to San Francisco prior to game six. And you think about where all of this is now heading. Two games left. All you have to do is win one. At this point, 54% of the country, you were not alone, 54% of the country was watching the Toronto Raptors in this unbelievable run. On par in the U.S., their Super Bowl numbers were the numbers for the Toronto Raptors in their championship run. And I've never written anything down with respect to a call at the end of a game, because I always prepare for a game, and then I have always thought that the game dictates where you go. If it's tight, you stay with the game. If it's a blowout, then you have fun, and you do some different things. And there are games where you can do both, and the game has changed, actually, because a 20-point lead I equate it to a, go a two goal lead in hockey. 20 point leads in the NBA now evaporate within a minute. A couple of turnovers, a couple of three point shots, coach calls a timeout, they come back in, boom, hit another shot. The next thing you know, you're staring at a nine point deficit instead of a 20 point deficit and or lead. So anyway, I was thinking, how do you bring everybody 
together that has watched it all across this great country. And I want it to be simple with the call to the point and then state the fact, if it happened. And that's pretty much what consumed me for about 48 hours leading up to game six. I knew if this happened, I'm going to have to say something, right? Because you know it's a little bit different from touch them all. That was in that moment, right? This one would be different because the clocks are zero, and unless it was a last-second shot to win, maybe have something set aside. <clears throat> and so on that Thursday, it was really when I kind of had a, a sense of what direction I wanted to go. First quarter comes out, uh, unfolds, and Kyle Lowry goes off. Set the tone. Now, as we have seen throughout this series, as well as the postseason, endings can be a little bit tricky at times, right? Point nine left on the clock. Golden State calls a timeout. They don't have a timeout. Free throws for Kawhi. Danny Green inserted into the game, throws the basketball away. And you want to wait to that moment till there are zeros on the clock. And that's when I said, Canada, the NBA title is yours. And then just the fact, the Toronto Raptors are the 2019 NBA champions. And then you allow the pictures to tell the story. Our director, Chris Phillips, did an amazing job. And as he got up close shots of all the players, then I was able, after laying out for quite some time, because we know pitchers certainly in that moment do tell a story, I was able then to go back in and relive the journey that each one of these individuals took to get to that championship. And so there you have it, the championship journey of the 2019 Toronto Raptors, which was, I'm often asked about the players, and, and Brian, you know this, that the room, there's often a lot of conversation about the room. And the players on that team, they were at the stage of their careers that it was truly about one thing and one thing only. And when you have that, good things happen. The Toronto Raptors, interestingly enough, were the first team in NBA history to ever advance to an NBA Finals without a lottery pick. And subsequently, the first team ever to win an NBA championship without a lottery pick. And you say, well, geez. there's only two rounds in the NBA draft. Only 60 players a year get drafted, of which maybe half of them make a roster. So you then get into this development path that the Toronto Raptors have put in place with their G League team, the Raptors 905. And it has produced Fred Van Vliet, undrafted out of Wichita State. Pascal Siakam on draft night, ESPN gave the Raptors a D minus for drafting Pascal Siakam. And the list goes on and on. You have OG Ananobi now who has stepped into a starting role. But there is a connection between that, the development of players, then ultimately using those players in order to acquire Kawhi, in order to acquire Marcus Saul, and then make that ultimate jump into a championship caliber team of which they did. Um, I don't know if it ended there because then we had the parade, three and a half million people. And I'll give you a little bit of insight into that day. It, it, how many people, did anybody go to the, to the parade that day? How many watched the parade that day? Yeah, it was amazing. What an event, right? And a joyous one, you know, with, unfortunately, um, a moment that wasn't. And so I was hosting on stage, 
And Mr. Tannenbaum, the owner of the Toronto Raptors, one of the owners of MLSE, was on stage. And I was, as you're looking at the stage, stage left, the control room was stage right. And I had an IFB, an earpiece in, and I was told that, um, that there's an emergency and I have to get Mr. Tannenbaum off the stage. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what is the emergency, right? Because there's different ways to handle those situations. And, and I will tell you that anytime that you go in front of an audience, whether it's today, whether you're on the air, you always have to be prepared for those unexpected moments. Uh, there have been plenty of examples through the years, whether it be Jim McKay in the 72 Olympics, whether it's Al Michaels during the World Series, uh, with uh, the Giants and the A's, uh, with respect to the earthquake. Uh, there's been, in, in the Bay Area, there's been many examples that you have to know in the back of your mind that a situation may happen. And so I look across to where the control room was situated, and I make my way behind the back of the stage. And I go up to, to them and I say, what, what is the emergency? Because I'm thinking if somebody's having a heart attack, I've been there all day and I know obviously water, I mean all the different things are. If somebody's having a heart attack, I can get on the microphone and say, okay, can we move here? We need paramedics to come here. And they're like, well, we don't know. And I said, okay, is there somebody close by that could tell us um, what the emergency is? And a, uh, a gentleman, with uh, a press pass, or a credential, I should say, it wasn't press pass, but it was a credential, with bear, bear written across it. And I'll tell you the, actually the funny part of that story later. Um, says, hey, I have the walkie-talkie talking to the authorities. And I said, okay. <clears throat> and so he grabs the walkie-talkie, says, hey, Matt Devlin's got a question. I said, okay, I guess I'll ask the question. I grab it, and I go, what is the emergency? They said, there's a gunman at Queen and Bay. That was all the information that I had. And I turned from there, and with the assistance of a couple of people, I'm making my way to the stage. I lean over to Mr. Tannenbaum, and I said, Mr. Tannenbaum, I apologize. I have to interrupt you. There's an emergency, and I have to make an announcement. And then the um, Ant Anton and a couple of other people were there to kind of further explain the situation uh, to Mr. Tannenbaum, and that's when I took the microphone. And in those situations, as I'm walking up, what I remember most is what my mom always told me and drilled into the back of my head, your words matter, your words matter. And in that moment, thankfully, I said to myself, because there's so many other people that could have handled that situation the same way I did, that your words matter. And I knew to be calm, cool, collected. Fortunately, the situation didn't escalate. But the most important thing that happened in those moments at the parade, before the celebration started again, was that the prime minister didn't leave the stage. That's the truth, right? Things always in those moments have to work out. And fortunately, the prime minister didn't leave. And if you go back and watch the video, which I did, there's a moment where he looks off to his right and gives a nod and says, okay. Well, I know that there's RCMP there. I also know that there are snipers all lined throughout Nathan Phillips Square. And if he had left the stage, then I think it would have been, we would have been dealing with a different situation. But fortunately, he did not. And fortunately, the situation didn't escalate. And fortunately, the Raptors went on to have an absolutely spectacular day. Just ask Marcus all about it, right? <laughs> um, so it was just, it was just spectacular. The quick story about Bear. I'm telling this story. I'm like, you know, a guy named Bear. Well, who's Bear? Bear is Mike Ferryman, and Mike was the first ever Carlton the Bear. So his nickname is Bear. So Bear was the one. Carlton the Bear was the one that actually gave me the walkie-talkie to speak to the authorities. Um, so the Raptors, it was just an unbelievable run. And to me, the most important piece to it all was that an entire country 
really got behind him. And I think from a generational standpoint, the impact is going to be enormous. It really will be. And just like the Carter effect, I think 10, 20, 30 years from now, there'll definitely be a championship effect. So thank you, everyone. Does anybody have any questions about my career? Yeah. I'd like yeah. To just take three minutes. Yep. First job out of college, yep. and then from there, just yep. three minutes on your career path and get to the, yep. get to the show. Yep. So I started in Abilene, Texas. I was in studio, and I didn't even realize that doing play-by-play, -play, you could make a career out of it. Uh, the reason why I ended up in a small town is because when I was getting out of school, somebody told me, go to a small town and work your way up. And that's where you make all your mistakes. Guess what? I was not born to do what I do. I mean, maybe there's a part of just getting up and talking that I like to do and um, those sort of things. But there was a lot of hard work along the way. I was absolutely horrible at the age of 22. I was. I was bad. Um, Matt, did you broadcast while you were at BC? No, I did not. I, I went to BC. I got cut by the baseball team my sophomore year. And I couldn't play the game anymore. And I thought to myself, how am I going to hang around it? And so my senior year, I got an internship. In fact, I tried out for the television station at Boston College and they said I wasn't good enough for it. And so my senior year, I had an internship at Channel 5 with Mike Lynch. And so I worked there, and then that led to ultimately another internship uh, in Texas, which ultimately led to Abilene, Texas. Okay, so for our young people here, yeah. internships, persistence, yeah. you got kicked in the ass a couple times yeah. and just kept pushing? Absolutely. Look, at, at the end of the day, as hard as it is to get your first job, it, as all, everybody knows, it, it, it's a pyramid, right? There's a lot of entry-level jobs. There's only 30 jobs of what I do. There's 31 in the NHL. There's 32 in the NFL. There's just not that many jobs. And so you have to first get on the base of that pyramid. And what I did was I kept a notebook of every single phone call. Back then, it wasn't emails, and, and it was not voicemails. And maybe in some way that helped, because you could actually pick up a phone, and somebody would answer it every now and again. Uh, so every single day, I kept a notebook while I had the job that I was in of what I was doing in order to get the next job, in addition to trying to get better at the job that I was in. And I always took a job for where it would get me in five years as I came up the ranks. So from Abilene, from Abilene, I decided I wanted to get into play-by-play. -play. I went to Springfield, Illinois as a number two announcer for the Midwest League Springfield Cardinals for $3,000 during the summertime. And during that time, I also pulled tarp. I handed out hats. I sat in the stands working with an old Radio Shack uh, cassette recorder because the GM Lee Landers told me I wasn't any good to be on the air so you better get in the stands and sit there next to all the fans and work on your play-by-play. -play. From there I went to the winter meetings in Louisville, Kentucky and I didn't get a job um, right away. I was interviewed and interned for quite a few. At that time I was back in Texas doing high school football. Charles McCullough, you still owe me $75 for that one football game I did. Um, and I interviewed for a job in Palm Springs, and I'll never forget, there was five finalists, and it got cut to three, because the Palm Springs Angels said, you got to pay your own way <laughs> to get here for the interview, and I'm like, how the heck am I, you know, like, you're scrapping together, you know, stuff, and fortunately, uh, my father gave me some points that he had. And so I was able to fly out there. And this job was for $800 a month. And I'll never forget, they had the Palm Springs Angels auction that night that I interviewed. And I interviewed in front of four individuals, Kevin Hawking, who's a dear friend of mine to this day. And as I, they had the three, they asked me, when do you want to come in? And I asked my dad, who's in sales. 
And I said, what do you think? Should it be first, second, or third? He goes, go in last. Last man always gets the sales. Because the first guy in, everybody's thinking, you know, well, what's the next guy going to bring? What's the next guy going to bring after that? Well, that last guy, they already know what the two in front of you have brought. So now you have the floor. So anyway, I go in. As I'm leaving, I said, hey, I understand you have the auction tonight. Would you like me to help you work the auction? And they said, absolutely. I said, is there anything to do? I said, yes. Could you go get Leonard Coppett, who's a famed baseball writer, at the airport? And I'm thinking, yeah, sure. Give me a car. I'll go to the airport. I didn't realize that it was actually LAX. And so I had to drive in to LAX, pick up Leonard Coppett, and it was yeah, 100 miles away. And, and then I drive back. And then that night, I'm up on the microphone doing the auction for the Palm Springs Angels. I get home the next day, and I'm thinking to myself, come on, what else could I do? I'm 23 years old. I've done everything. I got to get that job. Sunday night, I get a phone call. Kevin Hawkian, Matt, we're going with Steve Keese. I said, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, well, like, what more could I do? And that was like a real kind of profound moment of, you know, from that day forward, there wasn't anything else that I was doing except I'm busting my ass to make it, right? There was nothing else in my way. I got a call the next day. Steve didn't take the job. You want it? I said, yeah, when do you want me there? They're like, how about... Friday. I said, I'm leaving tomorrow. I packed up my car and I drove to Palm Springs. Palm Springs led to Lake Elsinore, which led to UC Irvine basketball games for 25 bucks. Uh, a game, wide ranging experiences, because I always felt it didn't matter. One of the reasons why I chose baseball, minor league baseball gave me an opportunity, 142 games solo to broadcast over the course of 147 days. Every night I could be on the air. That's like five or six basketball seasons in one season. And so the more times I was on the air, I felt the better that I would get. And I put up there right in my mirror, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. And so I listened as hard as it was to every single broadcast I did. I also had to sell, um, you know, for Palm Springs and ultimately they became the Lake Elsinore Storm. Uh, which was a lot of fun. I was the number one sales guy for them and had a great time doing it. Uh, but then it became, okay, I want to move up the ladder. And I went to New Haven, Connecticut, and then ultimately did a lot of different things there, which got me an opportunity at ESPN, and that's really when things happen. But you have to, as all of us know in this room, you have to find somebody that believes in you, somebody that's willing to give you that shot and for me, ultimately, it was a gentleman that ran MSG Radio, Pete Silverman. And in 1998, he hired me to work WNBA New York Liberty, fill in New York Knicks, radio pre and post, pre and post New York Yankees, and then also Northeast Conference basketball on television. And that's ultimately when things really started to take off for me, fortunately. Uh, and then in 1999, a gentleman who was the vice president of entertainment for NBA Entertainment by the name of Adam Silver, uh, who's currently the commissioner of the NBA, hired me to work for NBA TV in the studio. And the arrangement that I had, because I still love being there and doing the game, um, the arrangement I had would I'd work three nights in the studio and then that would allow for the other four days to travel and continue to do Atlantic 10 basketball, Northeast Conference basketball, and all sorts of other uh, TVKO boxing. I've, I've done about okay, everything. So what, I want to get to cover that. How many different types of sports have you broadcast? You did basketball, baseball, football, 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 football boxing, yeah. boxing uh, synchronized diving at the Olympics for NBC. Um, synchronized figure skating for ESPN, uh, tennis Rogers Cup back in 2012. I had the opportunity to go to London for NBC, and I said, no, I wanted to, anybody that has done the Olympics knows it's a month commitment. And fortunately, Rob Corte at Sportsnet gave me the opportunity to stay home and do Rogers Cup tennis. I had never done it before, had a great time doing it. 
Uh, I've done wrestling at the Olympics in 2008 in Beijing, worked with Rulon Gardner, who was a gold medalist. Uh, any time for anybody that is interested in any, it's not just broadcasting, in any profession, the more you know, the more you learn what, everybody jo what everyone's job entails, the better off you're going to be. And that's the way I always viewed it with respect to announcing games. It didn't matter the sport. I was going to get better as long as I got on the air. Um, and, and fortunately, you know, from those opportunities, uh, 12 years ago, I was offered the job to the Toronto Raptors. Well, that, that's amazing, and that's what these guys yeah. have to hear. The, that persistence, yeah. that refusing to quit, getting back up again. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, everyone up here that talks, it, there's not a clear line, right? There isn't the finish line, oh, there it is, right? There's a lot of twists and turns, and there's a lot of people. What I do is subjective. There might be somebody in here that doesn't like the way I announce games, and you have to get comfortable with that, right? Because it's subjective. And then once you're comfortable with it, you just kind of move on. And so the most important thing is to, it's the old adage of, you know, don't take no, right? Get better. And all those simple things that you've heard a million times, it's the truth, right? And there's going to be people that say, hey, no, we don't like it, and others that do. So just keep grinding is the most important thing. Awesome. Thank you.